All right. Hello, everyone. Give me a little note if you can see and hear me. Hello, can everybody see and hear me? Okay, awesome, Alice and Stephanie, thank you. All right, we are ready to get started. Thanks for bearing with us as we switch rooms and move into the next presentation. So I am very excited um, to introduce our next speaker, Ms. Marta Pelayas, so the president and CEO of Family Violence Prevention Services. She has a master's in psychology and she's dedicated more than two decades uh, to serving vulnerable populations, mostly children. And so she's here to speak with us about violence prevention, which as we've been hearing lately in the news is on the rise here in our, with our families in San Antonio. So excellent timing, we're glad for you to be here. And just a reminder to our audience, you're welcome to ask a question, find that little link at the bottom right, um, ask the questions throughout the presentation. At, at the end, I'll collect them and uh, Marta will be able to respond to those at the end. All right. Here you are, Martha. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope that everybody is doing well and in good health. I want to begin by uh, sending my thoughts and prayers to the families who have lost family members to uh, COVID-19. So these are difficult days for everybody, um, much more so for those families. So my thoughts go to them. Uh, the topic of the day is domestic violence, and I will, uh, first of all, define domestic violence for you all. Uh, then I will go through what resources are available in our community for victims of domestic violence, adult and children. Um, so to begin with the definition, domestic violence is a progressive pattern of behaviors where one of the members in that relationship is controlling the other one through psychological, emotional, physical, sexual, financial means. I just want all of us to be on the same page with the definition. And the two key words on that definition are pattern and progressive. Domestic violence does not begin with someone putting a gun to her head. Um, domestic violence begins with subtle controlling behaviors. Um, and there is at the beginning, a lot of confusion on the part of the victim. Um, there is a lot of adjustment and accommodation to the new person. She may be um, <clears throat> wanting to please at all times without actually having lost much of her self-esteem. But as it progresses, um, the, the, the victim, in order to deal with her situation, begins to unfortunately deny. Um, I frequently say that the best friend of the batter, of the abuser, is the denial of the victim. So again, the two key words in that definition are um, progressive and a pattern. Um, many times you will see in the news there was a dispute between two people and then later on in the article they will refer to domestic violence. Well, is it a dispute or is it domestic violence? Because a dispute in the street may not necessarily be domestic violence. Generally, the domestic violence happens behind closed doors um, in the intimacy of a home where the victim finds herself trapped and incapable of doing anything else but taking it. So that is um, some of the striking differences between a dispute that can happen between two people that do not have a relationship between themselves and domestic violence. So now that I have defined domestic violence, I am going to very quickly, because of the circumstances in which we find ourselves, I'm going to refer to today, what is happening at the Battle Women and Children's Shelter. We are, uh, we have opened our doors since 1943, and ever since that day, we have never closed. We provide services uh, 24 hours a day, 
seven days a week, all days of the year, especially at this time when we know and there are projections that uh, estimate that domestic violence will increase during these days, and some of those facts are realized already, we are open and ready and embracing anyone that comes through our doors. Of course, we are taking certain measures like taking temperatures of those that come um, uh, into the shelter and uh, we also take temperatures temperatures to the in uh, to the population that is uh, residing at the shelter we're asking some questions related to the health of those that are coming in and if someone is showing some signs of discomfort cold like symptoms we will escort them to a holding room and we will offer quarantine uh, there until and if the um, um, the symptoms do not progress to more severe, we would call an ambulance and that person or family would be escorted to the hospital. So that is what we are doing. We have been very fortunate that nothing has happened. Uh, no one has shown any symptoms. So um, if you are in touch with any of those victims that may need the services of the shelter, please please, please come in. At this point, I think I should give that uh, hotline number. It's 210-733-8810 if anyone wants to come in. Now, Family Violence Prevention Services, we are a private nonprofit umbrella organization under which several programs reside. One of those programs is our residential emergency shelter program, the Battered Women and Children's Shelter. We also have housing available for the victims that um, go through the emergency program and they need housing. Let me remind everybody that the population at the shelter are categorized as homeless. Unfortunately, uh, fault of, of, of no, not, not the victim, the victim is not at fault here, she loses her home. Her home, in fact, was probably not a home, um, but just a house uh, where awful things were happening. Um, other programs of the agency include non-residential services. Not everybody is appropriate for the shelter. Not everybody wants to come to the shelter. Um, some people just want the violence to stop. And so for them, counseling is available for adults and for children. Um, also, um, these uh, services are available. If you call the same number, you can find those services. You will be referred to those services. We have an array of programs to help victims of domestic violence. One very interesting program that we have is um, Batters Intervention Prevention Program. You may have heard about those. There are just a few, perhaps two. It's possible that there are only three, uh, not more more than that, uh, accredited uh, programs to deliver intervention to the perpetrators. Um, it is a lengthy uh, program. It is a lengthy intervention. Uh, it has very little to do with anger management. So if you ever hear the word anger management as a, an intervention indicated for domestic violence. After this presentation, you will be informed and you will be able to contradict and educate that person who says anger management in the same breath um, with domestic violence. Why? Because anger management focuses on the environment. So, um, a perpetrator may say, well, I just lost it. I, I, I am so sorry. I didn't mean to hit her, but um, she, um, uh, I, I, I lost my job today. And as, as, as you can imagine, that's a very stressful situation. So I just lost it. Um, with the batteries intervention program, the locus of control is internal, meaning 
even if you lost your job, even you, if you are under a stressful situation, even if the children are crying endlessly, um, even if the environment is not the most conducive to calm, it is still your responsibility to lift the hand or not lift the hand and hit someone that you claim to love. So that is the striking difference. Uh, so it is accountability and responsibility to self, to the victims, and to the community. Uh, about the community, let me just say that I envision domestic violence as being at the very center of the community. Um, it is not a linear um, spectrum of social problems. I find it to be the most impactful issue in a community such that, and allow me to be utopic for a few minutes, if we could remove domestic violence from a community, many other issues would finally find some resolution. Some of those, and this is the intersectionality of domestic violence, directly related to child abuse, teen pregnancy, human trafficking, the high number of incarcerated individuals, low birth weight. The family is the most important social cell in a community. If the family is not doing well, the community is not doing well. Inversely, if the family is doing well, the community is in good health. So who is this woman that comes to the shelter, or men? We also shelter men. But because the majority of the victims are women, I will continue to speak um, as if um, women are the only victims. So who is this uh, woman? She comes to the shelter perhaps mm, two, one in the morning, typically on a Saturday night. She has three children literally clinging by her leg. She may have a six month old in her arms, barely in diapers, and she is perhaps wearing a bloody blouse or nightgown. If she brings anything, it typically is a black garbage bag where she is carrying all of her possessions, everything that she thought she would need, um, she puts in a, in a garbage bag and comes that way to the shelter. We hope that what is in there are identification papers, birth certificates, passports, those kinds of important papers. Sometimes uh, all she brings is the antibiotic that she was giving the baby because the baby has been ill in the last days and she has that in her purse. So not even the black garbage bag. She comes in, there is an intake that is done and um, if she comes uh, during the day, a staff of the children's department comes and takes the children perhaps to the cafeteria, play, perhaps to the playground if they want to and if the mother wants, to, um, wants that to happen. Um, after the intake, they are escorted to the cafeteria and a meal is served. Many times, many times they arrive without having had a meal. Um, so usually that is what happens. And then they're taken to the room and things begin to happen. Case management, legal services, counseling, a school on site, a clinic on site. Those are some of the uh, resources and services that we have. The Battered Women and Children's Shelter was not always um, the Batter Women and Children's Shelter. In fact, the name was Batter Women's Shelter. I found it necessary to add the word children's 
because of the impact that domestic abuse uh, brings onto the children. In fact, the majority of the people we help last year, 60,000 individuals agency-wide, the majority of those 60,000 people were children. When children are in the presence of domestic violence, even if they are not directly touched by the abuser, they are critically impacted, psychologically impacted. Children are taught from birth that the most important person is the father or the most important male in their lives is that father. They need to be like their father. In fact, you will hear many children, if not the majority, to say that they want to be like their daddy. They need to, um, they take model after the father. Imagine the uh, cognitive dissonance and the psychological impact on that child when that person, that society, is telling him or her to emulate is the same person who is beating the most important human being in their lives, their mother, and perhaps even hitting them, the children. So for that very reason, we thought that it was necessary to provide services specifically to the children, counseling services for the children. So when a mother arrives at the shelter, the children also go through a sort of an intake and patiently they establish a relationship with a counselor without ever knowing the children that it is a counselor. There is game, there are activities, there is school, and many times for all of those activities, a counselor is accompanying the children. Um, it is very important to understand that perpetrators of abuse, the majority of them say that they were abused our children, as, as children. Domestic violence is a generational factor. It, they learn it from the father, who learned it from his father, who learned it from his father, and so on. The history of domestic violence uh, is very rich and robust in examples. 753 BC, the founder of Rome, Remulus, declared that a standard of battering needed to be created. And he determined that a wife had to be beaten with a rod no larger in circumference than the width of his right thumb. That became the rule of thumb. That made it into um, um, the patriarchal law that later reached our coasts and that became the universal standard. So patriarchal entitlement is at the very center of um, abusing and it is one of the guidelines and one of the topics that is uh, dealt with at Batters Intervention um, programs. Uh, it is not about men bashing. Um, it is not about taking a position against men. I am the mother of sons. Um, I am married to a respectful husband. However, we have to be very conscientious of what goes on around us, culturally, socially, and everywhere where there is patriarchal entitlement. Domestic violence is, uh, on, on the part of the perpetrator, is not about demanding respect. It's about giving respect so he can expect 
respect back. So you give it, you can expect it. It's not about demanding it. Um, a little more about um, history. I, I find it uh, a, a curious um, entry in, in history. In 1871, Alabama became the first state to declare illegal to beat the wife. 1871. I found that curious that it happened in Alabama. But that law very quickly was circumvented by another law that was called the Stitch Law. The Stitch Law said, in spite of, of that initial law having prohibited a man to beat his wife, but the Stitch Law superseded that one. Uh, and it said that domestic violence law would not be applied unless the victim needed stitches. So some of you healthcare workers would um, understand and, and sympathize with that. Um, there, there was another uh, historical entry uh, in, um, let's see, that was in 18, in 1974 in 1974, and I have to read this because I'm going to quote. There was, a, it, it emerged, the, the curtain law emerged uh, where in North Carolina Supreme Court declared that, and I'm quoting here, if no permanent injury has been inflicted, nor malice, cruelty, nor dangerous violence shown by the husband, it is better to draw the curtain, shut out the public gaze, and leave the parties to forget and forgive. That became the curtain law. So we arrive today at, and that, that I mean, for some of us, that isn't too far, too far away. Uh, but um, we arrive today at a very robust um, a group of laws to protect uh, victims. However, sometimes I feel that we are not ahead, but we are just following the problem. It wasn't but six years ago, I believe, six or five years ago, that strangulation became a felony where it was only a misdemeanor in cases of domestic violence. I, I find that appalling that only five or six years ago, um, that was the case. Um, at this point, I want to um, make sure that what I bring to you has relevance to each and every one of the attendants. So I will welcome your, your questions. And while those questions are being posted, let me give you um, a, a few statistics. Again, I said before, two thirds of the population are children. So the majority of the victims of domestic violence are not women. By far, they're not men but they are children. That perpetuates the generational violence. Because if you have a little boy in your house and there is domestic violence and he is watching what is happening and no intervention is applied, that little boy by the age of 15, 16, if not earlier, will be displaying with a little girl that he may be dating, some of the skills that he learned from the father. If a little girl is in the same house, she will probably be taking the cues from the mother. Submissive, subservient, um, minimizing, and she will grow up and at 15, 16, when she's interested in that boy on the other side, 
she would probably go for the boy who is very assertive as she thinks, that is, aggressive, strong, even jealous. And there you have it. The next generation of victim and abuser are ready to um, go at it again in the next generation. So I see that some people are um, asking some questions. So if, if I may have some of those read, I'll be very happy to answer. Perfect timing. We have about just about 15 minutes left. So this is great. Okay. So let me start with our first question. And um, this person asked, with all due respect, why women, only men also suffer family violence and are shelters for males also? Absolutely. As I said before, we shelter men. Of course, it is not in the same place as women, but we occasionally have a father that comes with the children and we provide services, the very same services that we provide the women, um, beginning with legal services. We have four attorneys and the staff, two paralegals, one legal advocate, providing legal services to all men and women who come to us. Very good. And um, how long do women or families tend to stay at the shelter? I love that question because it is not a short answer, but I will try to summarize. Imagine the woman that comes, she is probably 32 years old. She has some college to her name. Um, she has no children. Uh, she has researched some of the uh, of, of her rights as a victim of domestic violence and she comes because she wants the safety of the place while her decree divorce decree is finalized uh, she has a good support system in let's say um, some, some some other city in another state and so maybe four weeks later once that divorce decree is finalized, uh, she is um, transported. We give the transportation uh, and she goes and joins uh, her family support um, system. Compare that to, I, I said that's perhaps four weeks, five weeks at most. Compare that person with the mother of three teenagers expecting um, six months pregnant, who was just released by the hospital. The husband butchered her hands 21 times in the presence of the children because she was for the longest time collecting coins and dollar bills that he left around to put herself through cosmetology school. She was practicing, and I'm thinking, as you can derive from, from, from the story, I'm thinking of a real case. She was cutting um, her friend's hair in another friend's garage on a Saturday morning when he had to go to work and she knew that he was out. But for some reason, he came back unexpectedly and found her cutting the hair of uh, friends, dragged her by the hair into the house, uh, throw her on the bed, and proceeded to cut her hands. And I said butcher because there was severe nerve damage. Um, as I said, she was released by the hospital to us. That woman stayed with us for two years. Uh, we intervened the children um, I think longer than that, if, if I recall. Um, that is the perfect example of generational violence. The 17 year old was not found, um, but after a few days, he was hiding in the bushes with the very knife that the father used to, um, to, 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 to butcher her mother, his mother. And uh, he was waiting for the father to come around so he could do the same to him. So 
that is another example of generational violence. So again, between the woman who stayed at the shelter for five weeks until her divorce decree, compare it to the woman that stay, who stayed with us for two years. So it's anywhere in between. Services need to be comprehensive. They cannot be a band-aid approach. We need to make sure that we solve and we um, bring respite to the emotional being of the victims and to the self-sufficiency, the self-esteem. We need to elevate them so that they believe that they can go on independent without having to have an abuser by their side. That was a long answer, but I just wanted to, to say that. Very good, thank you. Um, our next question is asking if you can clarify what cognitive dissonance means in this situation. Sure. When you're seeing something that doesn't quite, quite coincide with what you know, if you know cognitively, you've been taught that your father is the best, the most, and the person to emulate and to imitate, to take model from, but on the other, on the reality, your eyes are seeing this father um, quite frequently mistreat your mother, beat her, um, er erode her self-esteem, scream at her, kick her, throw things around. So that's what I mean by dissonance. There is a disconnect between what you're being told and what you're seeing. Thank you. And our final question here is, do you believe the numbers for domestic violence in men is low because they don't report it due to pride? That is absolutely the case. I still think that there would be a majority of women. However, men are socialized from birth to hide their emotions and to feel embarrassed if emotions surface. Men are not supposed to cry. Come on, you're crying like a little girl. Uh, come on, you know, they parents will say to the little boy, why are you crying? You just look like your sister. Um, they are socialized to appear strong um, and to find strength in not showing emotion, which is not true as men that may be hearing me know. Um, emotions are a natural response to um, stimuli on the outside. If you feel like crying, men, you should cry. That's why you have lacrimal glands, um, tears in your eyes. They need to be shed and boys need to express themselves in however way emotionally they um, choose to. Thank you so much. And um, thank you so much, Marta, for being here today. Um, I know this was uh, some great information for all of us, super timely and relevant, and just such um, a wonderful experience to hear you speak. So if our CHWs are looking for resources or to make referrals to the shelter or um, to the Violence Prevention Services, what's the best way that they can do that? I'm sorry, again, my, 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 my thing was going tick, 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 tick while you were talking, I couldn't hear that. Yes, no problem. If our CHWs are looking to make referrals or find out more information about the shelter or Violence Prevention Services, what's the best way for them to go about that? Absolutely, you can go into our website, www.com fvps.org that stands for family violence prevention services fvps.org or call the hotline 210-733-8810 all services are free of charge with the exception of the batter's intervention program why because it is a symbolic ask that they pay $25 per session so that they get the feel 
of what it takes to mend the lives that they have hurt. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, we'll, and we will share the contact information for the center uh, in our follow-up email with all of our guests today. Um, thank you so much. Any final words you'd like to say before we close out? Again, two thirds of the population are children. 80% of homelessness is directly related to domestic violence. I just thought that, that that statistic is quite striking and very important to remember. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Um, let's give uh, Ms. Marta a virtual round of applause in our chat if we can. Thank and, you. Um, <laughs> I will go ahead and post information on how to move into our next room in the chat bar, so look for that in just a moment.